Honorable viewers, I welcome all of you to my YouTube channel, Department of English. Today's topic is Ode on Melancholy by John Keats. Summary. So let's get started. In order to fully analyze Ode on Melancholy, one must first understand that melancholy was viewed for the longest time as an illness. It was an imbalance in the body's humorous, specifically specifically an overabundance of black bile that led to ill temperament, mood swings, anger, and a brooding disposition which for the discerning reader might have very well been the categor categorization of the inter-romantic period. John Keats as a junior doctor would have almost certainly come into the definition and the treatment of melancholy during his training. Which is why this particular poem, Word on Melancholy, is so interesting in its writing. Written in the spring of 1819 as part of the famous Great Odes, Ode on Melancholy differs slightly from the others in the fact that it addresses the reader rather than an object or an emotion. It is also the shortest of the odes, with only three stanzas of ten lines each, a total of around 200 odds, and packed with Greek mythology and imagery that kids no doubt gleaned from his studies at any field and from his interest in the classics. Ode on Melancholy Summary Ode on Melancholy, while not amongst the most lauded of the odes, is perhaps the most uplifting and hopeful of all of Keats' odes. Whereas the others dwell on the injustice and the misery of life, in Ode on Melancholy, Kids addresses the reader a sufferer of melancholy and tells him not to worry that beauty and pain are intertwined in the world and that both offer a fuller view of life when occurring in tandem. Melancholy, a notoriously and beautiful subject, is turned beautiful by kids following odds and his for addresses. It is odd pointing out that Keats originally had this written as a four stanza poem. The first stanza was removed just before it was published in 1820. The missing stanza was as follows Thou you should build a bark of dead man's bones and rear a pantom. Give it for a mast, steers, creeds together for a sail with groans, to feel it out, blood stained and aghast. Although your rider be a dragon's tail, long severed, yet still hard with agony, your cords, large uprootings from the school, a blood medusa, certes you would fail to find the melancholy whether she dreamed in any easel of late duel. Her lord, Bolom, stated that should the first stanza have been published, it would have upset the delicate valence of Ode on Melancholy, which is at its heart an acceptance of the state of melancholy an embrace of misery that resonates with the reader in its simplicity. Ode on Melancholy Breakdown Analysis No, no, go not, no, too late, neither twist, of Spain, tight rooted, for its poisonous wine, nor suffer they fail for hate to be kissed by night, Shade, rub grave of Prusarfine, make not your rosary of you berries, 
nor let the vital nor the death mouth be. Your mournful says, nor the downy wall of Varjna in world sorrows mysterious. For shade to shade will come to drowsily and drown the workful anguish of the soul. Lead the Greek goddess of underworld river of oblivion, also fissures in ought to a nightingale. In the first stanza of no Ode on Melancholy, Keats lists what not to do when beast beset by melancholy. This is also perhaps why the earlier first stanza was rejected by using a heavy amount of negative odds. No, no, no. Keats actually manages to drive his message in further considering that he is speaking about the idea of melancholy and bad temperament. The negative grammar helps to reinforce the idea that melancholy is a part of life, that one cannot escape it by praying for oblivion or drinking of Spain. Also not an intervening of death within the pierce. It was well known for melancholy, it caused a brooding temperament and a wish for death, but Keats' masterful imagery and his dreamy invocations bring to the forefront the infamous dream all that is glimpsed throughout all his work. In Keats' old, in, in Keatsian poems, the world is made up of myth and legend. This is also the case in melancholy whose imagery is made up slowly of almost religious motifs and Greek myth and the splash of color, rubby grave, which helps to ironically bring out on melancholy life. But when the melancholy feet shall fall sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud that pastures the drove headed floors all and hates the green hill and April shroud. Then galled the sorrow on a morning rose, or on the rainbow of the salt or saint wave, or on the wealth of blood, fiends, or if the mistress some raised anger shows, imprison her soft hand and let her grave, and feed deep, deep upon her eyes. In the second stanza, Kids moves on from what not to do when beasts visit a by melancholy to what to do. He notes the idea of melancholy suddenly appearing, a detail to which he mentioned in a letter to his sister and brother, as being debilitating, almost changing the world, reading it with a modern perspective. One can clearly draw allusions to diffusion. The way that Keats describes the sudden fall of melancholy, the way that the imagery suffers for it, turns drop hated flowers, and hides the green hill in an April shot. However, what becomes evident to the reader is the beauty of this imagery. It is not only the beauty of Kitsian poetry of John Keats putting pain to pay for and delivering a journey of her myth, her pleasure. It is the beauty inherent in melancholy, a short of preciousness that Keats attributed to sadness as helping him to appreciate life further. Although it has its gay pains, says Keats, it helps on understand the scale and scope of happiness in life, what is life without a measure of sadness, so that one can accurately see how happy one is. Thus, Keats' suggestion is to enjoy the bursts of melancholy that come across the reader, then guard their sorrow on the morning rose or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave or on the wealth of gloved fainers, or if the mistress some raised anger shows, imprison her soft hand and let her rave, and feed deep, deep upon her pillless eyes, 
She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die, and joy whose hand is ever at his lips, bidding adieu and hasing pleasure nigh. Turning to poison while the bee mouth chiefs, a in the very temple of delight. Pallid melancholy has her sovereign sheen, though seen of none save him whose sternest tongue can past joy's grave against his fled fight, his soul shall taste the sadness of her might, and be among her cloudy trophies hung. The final stanza of modern melancholy kit shows the importance of melancholy, shows that melancholy is entwined with so much of the higher and most beautiful forms of life. With beauty, beauty the must die and joy whose hand is ever at his leaves bidding adieu. Thus it is impossible to have a complete life without melancholy. It is impossible to live with one half the emotions and this sense of contradiction helps to strengthen in the, the ideas that Keats wishes to express to his readers. And he does this through contradicting but effective imagery such as the example of April. April is a sad and rainy month but it is beautiful in its own way and leads to the blooming of those drop-headed flowers. A morning rose, although fleeting, fleetingly alive, has a beauty that brightness. Okay, so let's discuss historical background. This is the world that we cannot ex expect to give away many hours to pleasure. Circumstances are like clouds continually, continually gathering and bursting. While we are laughing, the seed of some trouble is put into the white arable land of events. While we are laughing, it spurs, it is grows and suddenly bears a poison fruit which we must pluck, even so we have laser to reason on the misfortune of our parents. Our own task as too nearly for words. Very few men have ever arrived at a complete disinterested disinterestedness of mind. If you have been influenced by pure desire of, of the benefit of others in the gathered part of the benefactors, so humanity to humanity, some meritorious motive has solid their gather, some mellow, melodramatic scenery has fascinated them. From the manner in which I feel has lambs misfortune i perceive how far i am from any humble standard of of disinterestedness yet this feeling ought to be carried to its highest peace as there is no fear of its ever enduring suicide which it would do i fear pushed to in extremity for in wildness of the how would lose his breakfast of robins and robin his of worms. The lion must stay oil as the shallow. The greater part the, the greater part of men make their way the, the, the same instinctiveness, the same and wandering I from their purpose. The same animal Eagerness as the hawk, the hawk wants to wants a mate. So does the man look at them both. They set about and procure one in the same manner. They want both. They want both a nest, and they both set about one in the same manner. They get food in the same manner. The noble animal man for his amusement am smokes his pipe. The hawk balances about the clouds that is the only difference of their lasers. This it is that makes the, the amusement of life to a, a speculative mind. I go among the fields and 
cast a glimpse of a stout who stood over a pale mouse peeping out of the withered grass. The gator had a purpose and its eyes are braying with it. I go amongst the buildings of a city and I see a man hurrying along to what? The creator has a purpose and his eyes are bringing with it. But then, as also says, we have all on human heart, there is an electronic, electric fire in human nature tending to purify so that among these human creatures there is no continually some birth of new heroism. The pity is that we must wonder at it, as we should at finding a fear in rubbish. So that's all about auto melancholy for the timing. Thanks for your patience here.